You know, earlier I mentioned in the reference to sunlight, I talked about dopamine and testosterone. Testosterone has a huge number of effects in the body and its sibling molecule, if, if you will, uh, dihydrotestosterone is perhaps the more dominant androgen in humans. Dihydrotestosterone. Yeah, DHT. Okay. Uh, you know, there are pharmacologic versions of this, right? Oxandrolone, Anivar, I'm not suggesting people take those, right? What I'm talking about is the DHT you make naturally. Very powerful androgen. It's converted from testosterone into, D you get DHT in a conversion of testosterone to DHT through a molecule called 5-alpha reductase. Anytime you hear ACE, it's almost always an enzyme. ACE is basically, you know, cat, you know protonase, you know, okay. So DHT, uh, it's gonna cause some male pattern baldness. So this, uh, widow, your widow's peak, mm -hmm. yeah, your widow's peak, Yep. Yeah. Well, what, what was it? Widow's peak? <laughs> sure. Uh, until you get off there. My, my now elaborating widow's peak, that's dihydrotestosterone. It causes beard growth on the face and causes male pattern baldness. has inverse effect on the scalp and on the face. Okay. It has other effects, strength, et cetera. The testosterone molecule and the dopamine molecule bear a very close relationship. So if somebody pushes, pushes, pushes really hard, wins, 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 yes, that will increase testosterone. Winning increases testosterone. Losing decreases testosterone in all venues. Yeah. So they look at this with, with day traders. You win, 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 more money, they get more testosterone. Losing, okay, now here's the interesting thing. I had an episode of the podcast with the great Robert Sapolsky who wrote Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, The Trouble with Testosterone, et cetera. Let's talk about the effects of testosterone and DHT in the brain. The main effect of these androgens in the brain is to make effort feel good. Because of the way that testosterone and DHT bind to receptors and activate certain components of the amygdala. We always think of the amygdala as a fear center, but it's a threat detection center and it has a lot of different parts, including parts that allow you to be forward center of mass in response to pressure. So. Am I suggesting people take exogenous testosterone? No, that's a personal choice that people can explore on their own if they wanna do that. But if you've been pushing, 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 and winning, winning, or just pushing really hard, and then you've experienced that crash, a lot of people need some time to recover in order to be able to come back and be able to work hard again. But here's what's really interesting. Not only does testosterone make effort feel good, effort increases testosterone. So this is the athlete or the student who's like, I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna do anything. Getting into some degree of forward center of mass. Mm -hmm. I always say, I think I picked this up from a team guy, it's very mm -hmm. team guy language. You can either be back on your heels, right. flat footed or forward center of mass on anything. Mm -hmm. Getting into that forward center of mass, mental orientation can start to trigger some of the pathways related to these hormones and these neuromodulators. What you don't want to do is start using a lot of exogenous factors, caffeine, or a lot of things outside of you in order to try and create those states because then you're gonna further deplete your dopamine and so on. When, I think you went on Rogan at one point and I overheard a portion, I listened to a portion of the conversation where you said you had um, been working really hard and then you went on vacation and then you got sick. Yeah, yeah. So this is interesting, that's the autonomic nervous that's system. That's happened to me like numerous times. Okay, so, so there's a very clear explanation for, for that and a very simple remedy. Although it's not obvious, which is why many people experience this. Many people experience studying for finals and then it ends getting sick. Taking care of a loved one, round the clock. The person either gets better or sometimes dies or whatever it is, and then the caretaker gets sick. Why is that? Well, we always hear that stress compromises the immune system. Nothing could be further from the truth. Stress activates the immune system. Think about it. How would your immune system, your spleen and your other immune organs of the body know when it's under pressure? Well, you could have some foreign bacteria or virus in your body, but when you are in a mode of go, 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 the molecule adrenaline triggers the release of killer B cells and T cells from the spleen. It's when you relax. Now you need to get your sleep, but it's when you finally experience that symmetric swing back of the seesaw. So you're go, 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 boom. And then you completely relax and you're hanging out with me and all of a sudden you get the sniffle and the rest of the thing. This is, there's a beautiful study done by, that was done in response to none other than Wim Hof, believe it or not. There's a really beautiful quality scientific study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they had two groups of people. One group meditated, the other group did Wim Hof type breathing. So what we call in the laboratory cyclic hyperventilation. So inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale 25 times. <sighs> forceful inhales and forceful exhales. Then hold your breath, lungs empty for 15 seconds, repeat for about three rounds. What does that do? Why do you heat up adrenaline? It's such a generic thing, it's adrenaline. You could have gotten into an ice bath, adrenaline. You could have someone shouting in your face, 
adrenaline. It's just adrenaline. What, what did they do? They injected both groups of people with E. coli, injected them with E. coli. One group gets nauseous, vomiting, and feels sick. The group that does this cyclic hyperventilation, Wim Hof, also called tumotype breathing, far fewer symptoms, if any, including lack of fever. So why? Well, they were able to combat the, the attack of this bacteria. So if you're coming off of a hard bout of work and you're starting to relax into vacation, you would be wise to still get into some cold water. You would be wise to still do some cyclic hyperventilation breathing. Certainly don't do those at the same time. A number of people actually have died doing cyclic hyperventilation and then doing breath holds because when you exhale a lot of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is the trigger to breathe. This is really important. If, if you do hyperventilation, <sighs> And then you hold your breath, you can do a much longer breath hold than you could if you just started off without having done that. Why? That you don't take breaths because of a need for oxygen, although you do need that. You take breaths because of a buildup of carbon dioxide triggers these brainstem neurons, which have you do the gasp reflex. <gasps> okay, well, if you dump all your carbon dioxide and you're not a skilled uh, free diver, like Mark Healy or somebody like that who really understands that, what happens is you're swimming along, you're like, wow, I can really hold my breath down here a long time. Lights out. Actually, I'm aware of a few people in the military community who, who've dabbled with Wim Hof tumotype breathing and have died and not, it's not good. I yeah, think it's, it's not allowed, basically. It's not certainly not encouraged from what I understand. So do it on land away from water. And the idea here is that adrenaline protects us. You don't want it cascading out of control so that you can't sleep. You want to use things like non-sleep deep rest and the appropriate timing of light and exercise, et cetera, to be able to sleep well at night to reset all these systems. But if you go too quickly from go, 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 go to complete relaxation, your immune system, your defense system will crash too. And so you're not going to be able to fight off even the, even the smallest or the, you know, the pettiest of viruses and bacteria. That's when you get the sniffle, you get sick. You're like, I'm finally resting. What's going on? So you can taper out of those high intensity phases. There are actually you know, guys in the teams now that I think are aware of this and are starting to think about this and for various effects. But in the mind, testosterone makes effort feel good. Adrenaline puts us into a mode of readiness. Dopamine puts us into a mode of motivation. And then there's the mirror side of all this, which are the neurochemicals that broadly defined promote relaxation and parasympathetic activation. And those come under the names that you probably heard them before, like serotonin, oxytocin, and the hormone prolactin. Serotonin and oxytocin are molecules that make us feel good, make us feel soothed, not in response to things that we're motivated to go get, but in response to what we already have. So this might sound a little woo, but you know, if you sit there and do a gratitude practice, or you hang out with your dog and your kids, or you eat a meal, right? You're nourishing yourself with food that you are not in the process of having to kill first. You're just really in, you know, Thanksgiving, um, a, a few moments of, of appreciation, simple things. The feel good that you experience, the love and kindness meditations, these mm -hmm. kinds of things, we know based on neuroimaging studies and blood draws and things of that sort, promote the release of things like serotonin and oxytocin. That nature has designed beautiful systems of pursuit and pleasure that are designed to oscillate and designed to keep us in pursuit and pleasure cycles. In relationships, typically the dopamine phase is the early phase. Simultaneously in these cycles? Oftentimes not simultaneously. Typically dopamine and serotonin are released. Always, there's always some floating around in our system at any moment, but typically dopamine and adrenaline are associated with pursuit of things that are outside the confines of our immediate possession in our skin. And serotonin is more about the things that we have, the things, you know, get seeing your kid, holding your kid, that promotes the release of oxytocin and serotonin. It feels amazing, mm -hmm. right? These are the molecules that led to our evolution as a species. So I'm not diminishing one or the other, but they need to oscillate, right? An early relationship, there are times when people aren't sleeping very much. It's like a mental illness. It's like, a, it's a form of mania. You're so excited, you don't need sleep, right? People are able to, to do all sorts of things at frequency and intensity that they find themselves two years later in a relationship and they love the person. It's very warm and cozy, but well, unless they're going off on deployments and coming back, they don't have that reset of the, of the system. So, you know, the ability to miss somebody, reset that pursuit and desire system. These are powerful systems and they don't just pertain to romantic relationships. This is also school. I always, you know, I always did summer school because I had to do a lot of catching up to do based on the, you know, <laughs> you know, a lot of catching up. But, you know, there's some value in taking a week off. And 
realizing you are truly resetting all the systems for pursuit. And I hear from a lot of hard driving folks who are like, wow, once I understood dopamine, I realized why I'm so burnt out. People think of adrenal burnout. Guess what? There's no actual medical term, adrenal burnout. There's adrenal insufficiency syndrome. That's a rare syndrome, but you have enough adrenaline packed away in your brain and body to for three lifetimes. Think about what people used to go through. I mean, you talk about some of this on your podcast, you see the images of people and you read the stories, you're like, you can make it through finals, kids. <laughs> so the, what happens though, is we're in such modes of pursuit and overthinking and overthinking. We need to learn how to switch back and forth on a regular basis, what I call deliberate decompression or non-sleep deep rest. Have a practice each day of 10 to 30 minutes where you're not on your phone and you're in kind of a wordless state. You're just either yoga nidra or you're just relaxing or not watching anything, not taking in any sensory information, not meditating, not journaling, just in a state of just trying to blank your mind and just watch how much stronger you come back in terms of your ability to focus and your motivation. That's one, I love the phone and social media has been very good to me and I appreciate many of its features. But one of the problems is, is we tend to fill our idle time with more sensory information. And that doesn't allow us to go into this deliberate decompression. It doesn't allow us to, you remember, I cut myself off, but a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a movie is worth a million pictures. Now I can scroll through millions of movies very quickly. And so the dopamine system is just a little bit overwhelmed. I don't think we need to be off our phones all the time. We just take some time to just deliberately decompress each day, any time of day. So, and you'll focus better. So you're getting hit with that dopamine on, on Instagram. So at first you are, but here's how you know dopamine. And it's, it will give you a window into addiction. If you're, if you're not an addict, you'll be able to sympathize with, maybe even empathize with addicts of various kinds. When you first get on social media, you're excited. Maybe you or Joe or somebody has a new podcast out, right? You know, you're excited. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. That's dopamine. You're motivated. But if you ever find yourself doing a behavior and you kind of don't know why you're doing it, like this doesn't feel any good anymore. It's like that, what is that Chris, well now he's, it's a funny story there because of the new stuff, but that Chris Rock thing where he's talking about like, you know when you're shanking somebody and your heart's just not in it? Like, <laughs> like, like, like he does this funny thing, right? I think it was him. You're sort of like that, like, yeah, hey, your heart's not in it. Like, what, why am I here? Why am I, what am I doing? I'm not even getting any pleasure, but here I am, like a, you know, rat pressing a lever. Well, that's, the dopamine system has been depleted. And so what you need is some time away from it. Could be 10 minutes, could be 10 days. And then it feels good again. True for relationships, true for exercise. You know, I believe in training hard and training often, but if you train too hard too often, you can't bring the intensity that you need to get the stimulus to adapt. And pretty soon you're either plateauing or you're getting worse. 